We'll talk about a culture that had very, very clear boundaries about everything. Husband, wife, kids, I mean, picking out your mate for you. And compare that with today where the blur of, I wonder what a man is supposed to do. What's a woman supposed to do? And, you know, so much has happened. It reminds me of a situation early on in high school. And I befriended a gal, and she was a couple years younger. And I remember going over to her house and meeting with her and her mom in the living room, and there was a picture of a man in military uniform. And, you know, I didn't know any better, and I said, well, who's that? And she said, well, that's my dad. And then I could tell, you know, the atmosphere in the room drastically changed. And then her mom added, uh, well, he's MIA in Vietnam. And I said, oh. And she turned to me, she goes, that means missing in action. And it's been about two and a half years, and, you know, we, we don't know. We don't know if dad's... A prisoner of war. We don't know if he was killed. And, and all of a sudden, my perspective of that young girl's life and the impact that it had on her, it really came into focus when she had a dad, sort of, because the picture was there and there was a memory of him. But in terms of his involvement in the family, because of the war, her father was stolen. And he was missing in action. And so they were doing family with this picture there, the idea of the dad, but in terms of his function, it was completely absent. And when you do the research today, what you find is in the great majority of all the homes in America, the father is missing in action. In fact, it's drastic in some parts. 70% of African American babies and 19% of white babies in the United States are born out of wedlock. Most will never know their fathers or experience what it means to be loved by them. Now think of that. I mean, that's drastic. The great majority of all the children that put their head on the pillow tonight will not have a father either in the home or deeply engaged in developing their life and building a close relationship and providing the kind of love and attention and direction that every little boy and every little girl longs for. And you've got to ask yourself, I mean, what's happened? How did we get there? I mean, how in 40 years, how did we go from Ozzy and Harriet to Ozzy Osbourne? I mean, back, back, remember when the GIs came back from the war and, and they I got the GI Bill and, and, and so they were all going to go to build these homes and there's little tracks now and suburbia was spawned and the TV show was Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver and Donna Reed and, you know, if you watch Nick at Night, even if you're young, you know what that stuff's about. And then over here now, the number one show on MTV is Ozzy Osbourne. Remember him? The lead singer of Black Sabbath, the guy who bit the bat's head off in a concert the guy who wrote the songs about suicide, he's been banned in multiple cities because of his lyrics. He's been sued by people because of suicide lyrics where kids listen to his lyrics and kill themselves in that exact way. The number one show. And what's the show? Over here, Ozzy and Harriet, you know, there's a man and there's a woman. And is it a little corny? Of course. But there's a sense of togetherness. There's a sense of moral responsibility. You know, Ward walks in and June says, this is what happened at school. And he turns to her and says, June, I'll go up and I'll talk with the beaver. <laughs> right? And over here, you got Ozzy Osbourne. It's a live sitcom where they take a camera and it's just filled with profanity where they have a dog that goes around and poops in different places in the floor. And they, he disses his kids and his kids diss him. And they swear at one another. And this is the family of 2002. Tell me. What in the world could happen from 1960 or so to 2000 where there's that dramatic of a shift? Early on, it was the exception to not have a father in the home. It was the exception. The word divorce, even when I was a young kid, was something that it was reserved for movie stars in Hollywood. And, and a small percentage of people that no one said much about, they got it. What could have happened? I want to suggest, though we can't go into it, there's about three or four reasons. And the first is the evolution of the American male. When the GIs came back, late, mid-40s, then back in the 50s, they had the GI Bill. They could go to school. We had, remember the baby boom? They're the ones that made all the babies, and we're the boom. <laughs> and there was this dream about a family, 
Uh, there was a great push into missions all around the world because GIs saw the state of the world. And there was a sense in which, let's make a better world. Remember World War II was the war, war to end all wars. And then the 60s hit and you had the sexual revolution. And what that did is it separated sex from responsibility. Regardless of the thinking or why or how it came about, what it did was it meant you could have sex with a person, but you weren't obligated to marry him, provide for him, or take care of him. And so sex and responsibility got separated. By the 70s, for many good reasons, there was a feminist movement. And a number of very good reasons about women getting equal pay, but that moved from there's no difference in the genders. Remember that? And then a lot of phony sociological research that said, you know, man and woman, they're exactly the same. Yeah, right. And then the 80s was the me generation. And what it meant to be a man was earn a lot of money and was drawn into work. By the 90s, we began to see the fallout. And the media had grown. And the values had shifted. And instead of absolute truth, we had relative truth. And anything goes. And postmodernism in its philosophical tenets began to weave its way into the average home. And then we had Columbine. And then we had kids shooting, and then we have violence. And now we have things, and we have a group shaking their head and scratching their head saying, how in the world we have children killing children? How is it that no one knows what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman? Why is it that now the family show, instead of leave it to beaver, is the Simpsons, and a male is depicted in the home like Homer Simpson, a doofus, who disses his kids and says sarcastic things, and everyone knows he's kind of the village idiot. What happened to the heroes? Early on, remember, it was John Wayne, and it may have been a little macho, but he was out protecting people and caring for people. When I was a boy, a hero was a policeman and a fireman and a doctor. You know why? Because it was noble and dignified to save lives. The heroes shifted. What are, who are all the heroes now in the last 20 years? Entertainers and athletes. Everyone wanted to be what? Like Mike. The most popular person on the planet for years was Michael Jordan. Someone needs to stop and say, what does Mike do for a living? He plays. <laughs> he plays. Everyone wants to grow up and play. And so the evolution of what it meant to be a man was to be good at playing. And to have sex when you wanted it, but there's no obligation. And then have this blurring of identity. And God bless those of us that had post-war dads, that great men, strong men, didn't know how to communicate their feelings. And the average man today from my generation on doesn't know what it means to be a man, doesn't know how to express his feelings, don't know what our role is in the family, doesn't know how to love a woman well, doesn't know how to raise our own kids. And all this is happening in a culture that's going circles and we're going, oh, I don't get it. And you might say to yourself, especially visiting, you might say, well, I don't know that that's all bad, yeah? I mean, maybe that tradition, tradition, like we heard, maybe all that tradition of the man's role and the woman's role, maybe that was all overdone, and maybe this is better. Let me tell you the results of absent fathers in America and tell you exactly what has happened. According to the National Center for Children in Poverty, boys without a father are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to go to jail, four times as likely to need treatment for emotional and behavior problems as boys with fathers. Dr. William Pollock, a Harvard psychologist and author of the book Real Boys, concludes that divorce is difficult for children of both sexes, but it is devastating for males. He says the problem is the lack of discipline and supervision in the father's absence and his unavailability to teach what it means to be a man. So now we have a generation that didn't have a dad and they produced the next cycle of generations without dads. And now we have a father absent society that says the greatest predictor of juvenile delinquency, drug use, chaos, divorce and jail time is when there's not a dad in the home. It is pulling our society apart at the very core of its being. Dr. Elam, author of Raising a Son, says that with the trouble with boys is the common theme is a distant, not just absent, but uninvolved father, and in turn, mothers who by necessity have taken the responsibility to fill in the gap. Sociologist 
Peter Carl believes that boys in our day now grow up spending 80% of their time with women and they don't know how to act as a man when they grow up. What happens, he says, is the relationship between the sexes is directly affected. Men become helpless and more and more, are you ready? Like big kids. The average male, stereotypical American's seat of choice is recliner, remote, and a Coors Light. True or false? What it means to be, we have men more fired up. You know, you watch a Raiders game. Guys get all painted up. They got the numbers. Let's go. We're real men. Doing what? Playing. Why tough decisions at home and leadership and discipline and teaching and moral values and making tough decisions are all delegated to either no one, to the TV, or to the woman. Uh, a Dr. Pierre Mornell is a psychiatrist in San Francisco, and with the absence of the father, talks about the impact of changing roles. And he wrote a book called Passive Men, Wild Women. He's a psychiatrist working in San Francisco, and he began to uh, counsel with multiple women whose men had very high-end jobs. Uh, High-level executives making lots of money, driving over the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, living in the top of these offices, doing big deals. And the women would come in, they had plenty of money, they could afford a psychiatrist, and over and over and over he'd get the same story. My husband is this powerful, dynamic, strong person in the workplace, and when he comes home, he has recliner-itis, along with newspaper barrier, along with disengagement from the children. And he's passive, and it's driving me wild. And then it produces children that are confused. Can, can imagine being born in 1980, 1985, being 15, 16, 17 years old as a young man, and what you have of the culture is what you see on TV. The average American boy, average American girl with a father that's disengaged, and just with all this stuff going around, ask yourself, what's it look like to be a man? And you know what you get? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. We don't know. And by the way, guys, um, I, I don't know about you, this is a hard one. I think from my generation on, most of you did not grow up in a home where you had a strong, loving, tender father. You didn't. I mean, all this dis dysfunctional family stuff, if we went around the room, every I remember one time in a staff meeting, I'm in the room with 12 other pastors and we're trying to figure out who should speak for Father's Day. And so we just asked the question, who on the staff, this is about six or seven years ago, who on the staff has a good relationship with their dad? <laughs> on the staff, eight of us had dads that were alcoholics. But man, I can tell you something. There's got to be a change. Because father absent families are the greatest predictor of absolute devastation in marriage, divorce, and what's happening in our society. And the impact is changing roles. We've got a generation of men who think being passive in the home is what they ought to do. We have a generation of women who now have turned wild. There's a psychologist in San Francisco, it's great, he wrote this book about 12, 15 years ago called Passive Men, Wild Women. And he's a clinical psychologist, and he had all these very successful people in the high-level financial districts driving over the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, coming in and doing these high-powered jobs, and he was counseling all their wives. And he would talk to their wives, well, what's your husband do? You know, making six figures and big time and executives here and executives here and making all these big decisions. But when he came home, he was hidden by a paper, totally disengaged with the children, couldn't communicate. He was passive at home and active out there. Why? Didn't know how to do it. And ladies, believe it or not, the most threatening place in the world for a man is to try to lead a family when you don't know what you're doing. And so he wrote the book. And he says when there's a role reversal and men are passive at home, it makes women wild. And they step into the gap and they're frustrated. And they're doing things they don't want to do 
but they got to get done, and then they have resentment and bitterness toward this person who ought to do them, and then they see this powerful person making big decisions out there, but not doing it inside the house, and you got major problems. And then that produces confused kids. And so kids say to their dad, basically, if you're going to sit on the recliner and read the paper, I'll go play video games. And I'll go watch movies. And we'll just rent videos. And we'll not have meaningful conversation. And we'll figure out how to be the rest of America. Where we let the tube be the sociological agent to shape all of our values. And then we're surprised because our families are coming out like Bart Simpsons. And we're surprised our families are coming out like Ozzy Osbournes. And we're surprised when kids are killing kids when that's what they've seen. And that's what they've been fed. And we're surprised that they're doing this aberrant behavior when the kind of violence that they're, you know, they kill a zillion people every day just on the video games. Many times in your home. So what do we do? The picture's kind of bleak. Well, there's a number of alternatives, but I'd like to mention two that I don't think we should go for. I think there's two PCs we must avoid. I mean, if, if, if you haven't got the sense there's a major crisis, get it, will you? Another generation, I mean another decade, like what's happening in the family, we will have such social and economic chaos and such violence, it will be unsustainable. We better turn the tide, and as believers, we're to be the salt and the light to make that happen. And we have the power. But there's two alternatives we dare not go after. Two PCs, I call them. One is to try and to be politically correct. That is a miserable failure. God bless the people with even the best of motives who wanted to bring about positive change. It does not work. There are a difference between the sexes. All views are not equal. There are certain things that are right and there are certain things that are wrong. The whole politically correct deal is killing our culture. But there's another PC we've got to avoid. And this is what I call the PC of pseudo-Christianity. Let's not assume. Let's not go back and put people in boxes. Pseudo-Christianity is where men were often abusive and dominant and, and uncaring. And where they played little kings and little tyrants and said, I'm the head of the home and you've got to do what I say. And women can never do this or never do that. Not from the Bible, but from the culture. So really the fundamental question tonight and men, if you have a pen, pull it out, because I'm interested in you taking notes. Ladies, if you want to, you can. But here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to turn the page and I'd like to spend the rest of our time together saying to ourselves, what does God say is a real man, and how do you become one in your marriage and your family? What does God say it means? Not Hollywood. Not your background, not, not any culture like the one we've seen on the screen or any place else. What does God say it means to be a real man? And how do you become a real man in your home? And I like to suggest that it always begins with mutual submission. We're going to talk about roles, but every time you talk about roles, people get all uptight. I don't mean boxes. It, there's a sense of which... You only understand roles when you understand Ephesians 5, verse 21, where it says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The word submit here is a very interesting and ancient military term. And notice, to one another. This applies to men with women and women to men, slaves to owners and owners to slaves, parents to children and children to parents. This same word. It's a military term. It's a compound word used. The first part, hupo, meaning under. The second part, tasso, implying order or rank. It means to be under the commanding officer. Rather than self-promoting self-assertion, it urges readers to be subject or submit to one another. One commentator calls this word a command to mutually desire less than one's due. Isn't that a great, isn't that a great way to go into a relationship with the roles of husband and wife? A command to not demand exactly what's your due. It's a sweet reasonableness of attitude in response to the Spirit's control. It is a divine calling. This is where roles start. It's a divine calling to consider the other person, your mate, more important than you. Mutual submission, here's the metaphor I like as a dance. 
See, we've spent all kind of time and all kind of rhetoric where people saying, who's the leader in the home? Is it the man or is it the woman? I got news for you. It's a lot more from scriptural. It's like a dance. And the issue in a dance is the beauty and the rhythm and the balance and moving to the music. It's not who takes the first step, is it? I mean, when you see, you know, like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers from a from an old movie, or when you see a great movie with tremendous choreography with men and women going in it, are you saying, oh, she took the first step? No, he took the first step. Or do you look at it and you say, whoa, man, that is awesome. How do they do that? They just look like they're in sync together. And so the metaphor I would like you to think about when we think of roles is the dance. Mutual submission, then, is the dance floor. The space within which we have freedom to move. It requires that a man and a woman, each under the lordship relationship of Christ, ask each other, how can I make you successful in this dance called marriage? How can I love you more? How can I serve you? Male chauvinism and female manipulation find no place here. They have evaporated before steps, roles, and responsibilities are even discussed. This is a dance that God designed for two people who say, obviously, our first commitment is to the Lord, to submit to him. He's the choreographer, and we want to figure out how to do this dance called marriage in a way that will honor and reflect his glory, his personhood, and will bring joy and fulfillment to us and to one another. The first step, men, in becoming a real man is mutual submission. Don't hear what you're going to be taught a little bit later tonight and, and go away with some sense of, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad somebody finally told me that I'm in the, the head of the house. <laughs> Anybody that has to pull up their belt and act tough and big and power up to be the head of the house is revealing for sure they're not. When you're the head of the home, you'll be like Christ. And he woos his bride into respect in relationship because of a sacrificial love that is so attractive that to do anything else would be foolish. With that said, the second thing we need to understand is that functionally speaking, in any dance, someone does have to take the first step. I mean, you can stand there forever and say, no, you go, you go, no, I'll go, you go. And with that, a great dance or a great marriage requires clarity of roles. You've got to ask and answer the question, whose responsibility is it to take the first step in situations? How does a man, how does a woman, what order do they go in? Who has which responsibility? What do they do and why? And the answer to that is in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 30. Notice that all the passage about men is in bold. That's because we're going to talk about men. And ladies, please come back. Your week will come, and I will put you in bold. <laughs> Second thing, can I say something, too? Because there's some of you women that are getting a little too excited about what's going to be shared. Okay? Just a just little, little deal here, all right? I'd like you to pray for me now. I'd like you to pray, if you're with your husband, pray for him. We're in such a warped culture, and most of the men sitting in this room, beginning with me, have had no clue about what it means to be a man. What I'm going to lay out that God says we need to be is the greatest thing for us. It's the greatest thing for you. We'll bring honor to God and we'll bless our kids. But it will be so counterculture if you unconsciously go into this mode, ladies, of, hey, yeah, preach, Chip. Go for it, man. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, like elbow to the right, elbow to the left, circling things you want to tell him later. If you have that attitude, you will destroy what God wants to do. In humility, you need to sit here and say, I have no idea how hard it must be to be a man in this culture, in this world, coming from the home that my husband came out of, and he just came to Christ maybe in the last six or eight or ten years, or maybe in the last couple. You know what? I think I'm going to sit here and pray for him because he's going to hear commands that are so radical and so impossible that if God doesn't show up in a major way in my husband's life, he's going to be just covered over with guilt. I mean, God's going to ask him to step up and love me the way Christ loved the church. And if I remember right, Christ died for the church. That's his calling? Before I start elbowing and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in humility you ought to pray, okay? 
With that said, here's the instructions. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, same word, hupo, right? Tasso. So also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands. Here's where we get down to business. Love your wives. Right above the word love, agape. Not family kind of love, he could have used that word. Not eros, not sexual kind of love, he could have used that word. Agape, unconditional love. And if you don't understand what that is, he gives you a quick word picture. Just as Christ also loved the church, and what did he do? Gave himself up for her. That's the calling. That's the job description. Love your wife the way Christ loved the church. And that cross is a reminder of what it cost him. Well, why? That he might sanctify her. Circle that word. It's a biblical word, but it means to make someone pure or holy or separate or special is the idea. Christ gave up his life for the church that he might sanctify her. How? Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Put a little box around the word. Most often in the Bible, when it's the word, it's logos. It means the written word. This is a different New Testament word. It's rhema. It's the spoken word. The way that Jesus created a church that would be holy unto himself is the preaching, the speaking of the word of God went out. People believe the gospel. And when they believe the gospel, their sins are forgiven. They come into the body of Christ. And it was the washing of the preaching of God's word that brought them from outside Christ to a part of his family in order that they could be holy and blameless and pure. Now he's going to go on and say, not only was it that they could be washed to be special relationship, verse 27, that he might present to himself, circle the word present. He wants to present to himself the church in all her glory. The word present there literally is place beside himself. Do you, do you, it's not this lording over there. He saved her, gave his life for her, the church, that he could take the church and present her beside himself. Why? To render her a, it says glory here, the idea is radiant. To render her a glory, glorious or radiant bride. And then in order to try and get your arms around what a radiant bride would be like, he gives us three negatives. No spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing. No stain, no spot. No wrinkle. Jesus gave his life voluntarily for his bride, the church, that she could be presented beside him, holy, blameless, without spot or wrinkle, for fu fulfilling her full potential. He saved her, gave his life, so she could become all that she was designed to be, holy and blameless. And with that picture, then look at verse 28, men. So, so... Husbands ought to love their wives, circle the word love, because he doesn't back down. He doesn't say love your, you know, Jesus, of course, did it with agape love, but guys, you know, you can do it with storge, family love. Or, you know, do it with era, no, -uh. agape love, same thing. So husbands ought to love their own wives, how? As their own bodies. Same kind of care, same kind of commitment, the same kind of self-preservation. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. How? A husband is to love his wife the same way he would love his body. And he wants to nourish and cherish it. And then notice what it goes on to say. Just also as Christ does the church, because we are his members. Men, you want to know what it means to cherish your wife? Put a little circle around that word and then draw an arrow. That phrase literally means to keep warm. See, a man's job is to love his wife in such a way that you keep her warm. And the inference is, is you keep her warm by protecting her. By cherishing her, that she feels special in your presence. You do things when you're away that makes her feel warm and special and important. 
It's to commune in ways that make sense to her. Jot down in the corner somewhere 1 Peter 3, 7, will you? We're commanded to, you see, you cherish your wife, but you live with her, 1 Peter 3 says, in an understanding way, where you become the student of your wife. See, how I need to treat Teresa is different than how you need to treat your wife, because see, she's different than your wife. Her personality is different. Her background is different. Our relationship is different. I need to become a student of my wife in order that I can keep her warm spiritually, keep her warm emotionally, keep her warm in a relationship with God. The second phrase he uses here is, and nourishes. Literally, the word means to feed. It means to be devoted to. It means to, to feed as in, not the actual feeding of, but to feed as in to provide for. The role of loving your wife is you nourish and cherish, you keep her warm, and then you provide whatever she needs spiritually. You provide whatever she needs emotionally. You provide whatever she needs physically. It's to promote the development, literally, here's an here actual copy definition from this word, to promote the development of and the maintenance of health. Now, that sounds like a pretty technical job description for your wife. Okay, I learned in church I'm going to promote the development of and the health of my wife. But think about what that means. Think about if someone gave you that, that job description for another human being to promote the development of. You'd have to know them. You'd have to have a plan. What are they good at? How do you help them? To maintain their health. Well, what's health mean? It means that things are right with God. Things are right with you. Things are right with the kids if you have them. Things are right in other relationships. And you give up your life sacrificially to love her, to keep her warm, and to provide for her. Summary. Men are to assume the same kind of responsibility for their wives that Christ does for the church. I mean, if you just want to Forget all the leadership thoughts. People get hung up on that word. The issue isn't who leads so much, it's who assumes responsibility. Men, we are responsible for our wives and families the same way Jesus is responsible for his church. And if that doesn't scare you to death, you're not awake. Second, men are to unconditionally, sacrificially love their wives the way Christ loves the church. That means, I believe, literally, die for her. Not just figuratively, not just as a metaphor. That means you need to die for your wife, die for her. It means whatever it takes. And when you, when you push it out that far, Christ died for us. Why? Because he gave us and provided for us in ways we couldn't provide for ourselves. And that's what a man does when he loves his wife. Can I ask you a couple questions, guys? And um, ladies, please keep those elbows close, tight. Might want to fold your hands here. And, and the goal of these questions is not to make you feel bad, not to make you feel guilty. The goal of these questions is just to find out who is assuming responsibility, who's leading in your home. Five quick diagnostic questions. Um, first question is, who initiates spiritual growth in your home? Who says, hey, maybe we need to sit down and pray, or uh, I think we need to come up with a little devotional for the family. Who's initiating spiritual growth? Who says, okay, clear the dishes, tonight's the night? Who handles the money in your home? I don't mean that you literally have to handle the checks, but I mean, who feels the moral weight? How much do we have? How much are we going to spend? What's going to happen? Are you in one of, or are you in one of those deals where, uh, honey, I don't know about this, I don't know about this, and we don't have enough for that, or... Who owns the moral weight of the finances and actively takes care of someone else knowing, hey, our bills get paid, our taxes are in line, Things are taken care of. We're planning for the future. Retirement we not, may not be where we want to be, but we got this thing lined out. Who does that in your home? Third diagnostic question, who disciplines the children when you're both at home? Back bedroom. Rare, rare, mom, dad. <laughs> who gets up out of the chair? Fourth, who initiates talking about problems, future plans, and areas of development? Who says, you know, hey, we, we got to talk. 
I mean, you know, we can't pay this big bill. We, we got to talk, you know. One of your parents is going to have to either go in a rest home or they're going to have to live with us or something. I mean, we got to talk. Who's initiating these kind of conversations? We got to talk. I'm really concerned about our daughter's relationship with that guy. He's trouble. We got to talk. We got to do something. Who, who is the one saying that in your home? Who's pushing those buttons? And question number five, who asks the most questions in your home and who gives the most statements? And you might wonder, why, why that one? The person constantly asking questions to find out what's going on, how are you doing here, what about this, can we do this here? When someone is constantly asking questions, it's because they feel the moral weight of what's going on in a relationship, and they've got to find out the data so they can respond appropriately. And guys, all I want to tell you, if like four out of five of those things, you, in your heart of hearts, you said, my wife handles all that, you're, you're in trouble. You are not leading your home, and you are not loving her well. And she will do it, and she will eventually resent you for it, and you're headed for a train wreck at some level. And by the way, if, if the woman is doing all that in a home, I don't know how many kids she has, but she's got one more than you think she has. I'm not trying to be funny. We live in this sexual revolutionary world. You know, what, you know, as I, Teresa and I have done seminars with Christian couples and done them with other churches, and, and uh, we used to do more of them than we do now, and she'd have a big session with the women about sexuality, and I'd have a big section with the men. These are all Christian couples. These are people that God, you know, he made sex and da-da-da-da. I got news for you. Sex among Christian couples, by and large, is lousy. And I'll tell you why. Because when the roles are out of order, there's not something very romantic when you have mother-son relationships, functionally speaking. You need to respect a man. You need to look up to a man. You need to feel protected by a man. You need to be provided by for a man. That's an attractive man. Not picking up his stuff and nagging him about that and honey, why can't do that? And we got to talk about this and we got to pay the bills and we do really need to. And so what's he do? He figures out what sports team he can watch and how to feel like if he goes out and earns a living and earns enough money, he's done his deal. Because he doesn't know different. He grew up trying to be like Mike. And he's, now he's a, he's a grown man trying to be like Mike. I got news. Life is not about playing. Playing is to relieve the stress for the great issues of life called glorifying God. Now, would you like some practical help on how to get there? Because right now, this is not a real happy room. <laughs> but you know something? Tell you face the hard truth. Men, until you look at that in the mirror and say, man, I don't, I don't even know how I got here. I mean, you, when you ask those questions, I thought, her, her, her. I'm doing that one, sort of. It doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean God's down on you. It means you've grown up in a culture and a system and you're reflecting the culture, reflecting the media, probably reflecting what your, your parents did. But it produces negative things in your relationship that you don't want and she doesn't want. And I got news. It will produce a next generation that's more dysfunctional than the ones we have now. So let's now, let's get real positive, okay? I, I need to get positive. You guys are looking at me like, should have come last week, should have skipped tonight. <laughs> Practically speaking. Practically speaking, what are we going to look at? Men, if you want your job description, this is the essential. We're going to build eight essentials. Essential number one is you say in your heart of hearts, the marriage covenant. Divorce isn't an option. I'm going to treat my mate like we're in covenant. Number two, husband's role, I'm going to step up in love. That's the role of the husband. That's the second essential. And the role is husbands are to step up and give their lives to lead their family in righteousness. By step up, that means you assume responsibility. You could call that leadership if you wanted. Servant leadership. And by give your lives, you could call that love and sacrifice. What does it mean to step up and give your life to lead your family in righteousness? Three things, I believe. Number one, husbands must love their wives sacrificially. That's from verse 25. And all I want you to do is right underneath there, love your wife in a way that costs you something. If, you're, if it doesn't cost, it's not love. At times, it'll be the cost of preference. As I was learning and continue to learn this, I remember in the middle of a slam dunk contest in the middle of an NBA all-star game. 
after I had rigorously preached all weekend, so I was exhausted, in need of this refreshment. And I was walking around, and I, you know, I could tell, you know, that my wife really needed a little attention. NBA. Teresa. <laughs> Slam dunk half time. Teresa. And in a moment of sheer grace, because it took that, I got up from my little chair and asked my wife if she would like to go take a walk and just talk. And you know what she learned? She learned she mattered. She mattered more than my stuff. She mattered more than my preference, more than my little game. Husbands, communicate to your wife when it costs you something. Sounds small, but <laughs> that was a biggie for me. Second, when it costs you your time. If you're going to lead your family, you've got to do some planning. If you're going to do some planning, it takes some time. We put in more preparation for our jobs. We put in more preparation about the lineup of a softball team than most of us do into what we're really trying to accomplish in our homes. Radically sacrifice and build in some time and think about where are you going in this marriage? Where are you going with your kids? And the final area of cost, I just call it the, the cost of rejection. We need to step up, and guys, you need to step up in the areas of your family eating together. You need to step up in the areas of family devotions, and you need to step up in the area of discipline. If your family isn't eating together a couple, three times, own it. This is what we're going to do as a family. Now, guess what happens? They all roll their eyes. I got practice here. I can't make it here. We're not going to do that. And you say, tell you what, our family is more important. This many times, this is what we're going to do. And then when there's a discipline problem and your wife is normally taking care of it and you don't want to take care of it, because you know what men, why we don't? It's because they don't like us. And they reject us and we feel bad. We, all, we get enough rejection because we live in that hard world out here. But if you'll step up and say, as a family, we're going to eat together. As a family, even if it's once a week, we're going to open the Bible, we're going to pray together. We're going to make a little list about what we're going to pray for each family member and once a week we're going to pray. And number three, when there's discipline issues, I'm the father, I'm going to own it. I don't have to, all the time. I'm going to own it. Here's what we're going to do about this situation. What do you think, honey? Let's get the right people in the room and let's address it. That's not happening in the average home. And the people handling all that weight are the women. And it is wrong. And there's a lot of teenagers that need some real strong boundaries. Your wife wasn't made to give them real strong boundaries. She was, she's supposed to lay across the bed, nurture them, and tell them, oh, yeah, how tough it is. And, you know, she really understands and cry with them. What you need to do is say, you know what, I'll cry with you later. Here's the boundaries, you did this, you're still grounded. <laughs> Someone in the family needs to do that. Men aren't doing it. I'm watching teenagers from this church float into areas and outside boundaries that they are headed for emotional and spiritual train wrecks and relationships that will be disastrous. I watch them listen to stuff, dress in a way, act in a way, communicate in a way that I'm telling you they're going toward a cliff and they're going to go over. And some dads better wake up, smell the roses and say, this is my daughter, my home, my family, and here's the border and the boundaries. Say it real nice, say it real loving, do it, let them roll their eyes, they'll hate you for two weeks, they'll love you for 20 years. Second, loving, what's it mean to love? Husbands must love their wives with intentionality. And here, just I would write down, purpose to, to develop your wife's greatest beauty and strengths. Purpose to develop. Jesus wanted the church to be a, a radiant bride. He wanted her to, to reach her full potential. So he had a plan. It means you have to plan time together. Men, do you have any goals for your wife? Is there anything you think she's good at? Do you have any goals for her? Any ways you want to help her? Is there anything she's really excited about that you could kind of be the servant and say, how can I help you be successful? It's with intentionality. Third, husbands must love their wives sensitively. The nourish and caring of her spiritual, emotional, and physical needs. And guys, all I can tell you is we're really slow at this and most of us aren't very good. But little things really matter to a woman. Uh, little things like little words of encouragement. Little calls when you're away. Uh, little jobs done that you said you'd do. Um, walking. Talking. Little things like you get the babysitter. 
Little things like you decide where you're going to go to eat. Little things like, I think there's something wrong. Why don't you tell me what's going on? Live with your wives in an understanding way. They long for that. They were made for that. They want you to assume that kind of responsibility and love them sacrificially, intentionally, and sensitively. As you turn the page, guys, just before you keel over and say, whoa, let's talk about what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean is that you always do what your wife wants. My experience with men who are what I call really godly men, I mean guys that really want to do what God wants them, these are the kind of guys, I mean, they are studying the scriptures, they're in an accountability group, they want to be God's man. And, And then every time their wife... You know, she sighs like, oh, what do you want me to do? Because I'm a servant. I'm a servant leader. What is it, babe? Tell me, you know. (laughs) And I mean, I watch him, you know. I've been there, done that. And so they want to be such a godly person. They give their wife what they want instead of what she needs. Your wife needs some risk. Your wife has a role we're going to talk about next week. She needs to get to do her role. And she needs at times for you to say, tell you what, babe, here's that box, and we decided how much money we're going to spend. It is pretty. I know you're excited. I know you want it. No, we're not, don't, we're not going there. Oh, but, 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 but. No. Remember, we made an agreement. We're not going to spend that. She will be disturbed for 20 seconds, miffed for 20 minutes, and two days later say, honey, thank you so much. Loving your wife doesn't mean she gets everything she wants any more than Her loving you means you get everything you want. Love means you do what's best for the person. Second thing, it doesn't mean you don't have a life. I mean, I've described this and you're thinking, nourish, cherish, my my land, my life's full already and I'm not loving her a whole lot, according to your definition, Ingram. I want to encourage you, it doesn't mean that you don't have a life of your own. Men, you need time with men. You need the strength to be this kind of man. You need to hang out with men. You need to work out with men. You need to have some time with men where you talk about life and get encouragement and get renewed. Your whole life can't revolve around your wife and your kids and work. There's got to be some time with other men where you get engaged and you get to talk about these issues and find an older man. Every younger man here, if I was you, I would, I mean, I've got about three in my life. Man, I'd find some guy who's older than you, five years, 10 years, 20 years, who walks with God and seems like he's doing like 10 years you'd like to be like him, just nail him. If you see one walking out, hug him. Hey, you mentor me or not? Come on, mentor me, mentor me. I'll get up at 5.30, I'll get up at 4.30, I'll meet you once a week, every other week, once a month, by phone, you name it, I'll do it. And ask him how to be a man. Ask him how to get in the Bible. Ask him how to love your wife. And he'll say, oh, I don't know. All all the older guys, by the way, don't give us that, well, I don't know, you know, I just, you know. I couldn't mentor anybody. Heck, you can't. You're doing what hardly nobody else is doing. Let the younger men come and just listen to them and, and, and tell them what you would, you would call common sense. It's not common anymore. Okay? It's not. You're a wealth. So let us come and learn from you. Third, it doesn't mean you make her dependent on you. Don't smother your wife. Don't try and work out her life. There needs to be a meshing, but there needs to be a a healthy separateness of separate interest in doing your own things. And then finally, it doesn't mean you call all the shots. You got that already. You're not doing that anyway. (laughs) If you think you are, you're really not either. We're not talking about men being little kings or tyrants. We're talking about men loving their wives the way Jesus loved the church. And so I have this question as we close tonight. Is there a man in your home? It's not rhetorical. Is there a man in your home? Is there a man in your home? A man. Not a big kid. A man. Is there someone who wants to own the moral responsibility of providing and protecting and leading and cherishing and nourishing and saying no and saying yes and stepping up and being a man? Is there a man in your home? If not, there can be one starting tonight. And you can say, God, I don't have a clue how to do this, but I think I got the message. If you'll help me, I'll do it. And I'm going to need to get with some other men to help me get there. There's a little card, and we've been going to have a card every week. And on this card it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. From this day forward, I will step up and give my life to lead my family in righteousness. 
And I'd like you men to bow your head. And if you're not trembling a little bit, you ought to be. I want you to know that heaven will celebrate and the grace of God and the Spirit of God will empower you like never before. Because if men step up and be men, marriages will change, kids will change, father absence will be a misty memory of that time in the latter part of the 20th century when families went down the tubes and God will do a fresh new work. It's got to start in my house and it's got to start in your house. And I'd like you to check that. I'd like you to tell God that's what you're going to do by His power.